Hi, my name is Michael Turner from Waterstone Insolvency. I'm here with my colleague Adam Bottrell. Today we'll be discussing the differences between liquidations and receiverships. It's really incredible um, how many people have heard about liquidations and receiverships but just don't know the difference or they think they're the same thing. It's often one of the um, sort of classic interview questions here at Waterstone that if you come in and ask, you know, if you're interviewing for a job, someone might ask you, do you know the difference between a receivership and a liquidation? And people that aren't can answer that question with a general outline um, are pretty impressive. Um, so first we're going to talk about liquidation and then about receiverships and some of the key differences. So Michael, why don't you kick us off about liquidation? In contrast to receiverships, the liquidation is the statutory end of the company. It's the process by which it's wound up, and at the end of the process, the company is removed from the register. That's in contrast with a receivership, on the other hand, where you're being appointed by a secured lender with the purpose of securing collateral, say, for example, a bank, to recover fixed assets. Okay. And in terms of liquidations, how can you be appointed as a liquidator? What are the kind of mechanisms that, that um, can start a liquidation? While there are other ways, the two primary ways in which people get appointed as liquidator is the following. By special resolution of the shareholders, under standard rules you require 75% of the shareholders to vote in favour of appointing a liquidator, or secondly by the High Court. To be appointed by the High Court, you need to file an application to place the company into liquidation, which is usually preceded by a statutory demand. Right. And then if we contrast that to a receivership, how, how does a receiver get appointed over a company? A receiver, on the other hand, is appointed when a secured lender, for example a bank, forms the opinion that the debtor is in default. It's a very simple process from there, in which case a notice of receivership is served and then the receivership commences. Right. And so in terms of the difference there, it sounds like the receivership may be appointed more adversarially. So you've defaulted on your obligation or your loan. The bank or the financier sees that. They think that their assets at risk. They bring in an outside person or a receiver to come and manage the affairs of the company and rec try and recover money. But that's not really a voluntary process for the company, is it? That's often an external party coming in. Well, sometimes receivers are appointed at the request of the, lend of the lendee. In most cases, unfortunately, it is more adversarial, as right. you say. Okay. And in terms of the powers of a receiver, do they have the same powers as a liquidator, or are they different? No. The, the statutory powers of liquidators are far more comprehensive and mm. diverse. Generally speaking, receivership statutory powers are limited to the right to inspect documents of the company, mm. whereas contrasting that with a liquidator where you have far stronger statutory rights as far as requesting copies of information, you can pursue other causes of action such as voidable transactions or transactions under value. Mm, which a receiver can't do. Yeah. Right. And it, I guess at the end of the receivership, what what can happen? What are the kind of options for a, for a company that's gone into receivership? Contrary to popular belief, a company can actually be in liquidation and receivership at the same time. So it largely, mm -hmm. it largely depends on what happened during the receivership. So there are receiverships where the debtor finds alternative financing options and the company comes out of receivership and continues mm -hmm. to trade. There's other options where the receivership, the receiver essentially sells all assets of value, notably the business, in which case a shell is handed back to the shareholders and directors. Right. Or alternatively, if the company is in liquidation, then it's handed over to the liquidator. Mm. And the liquidator may be pursuing a wide array of measures not available to receivers, right. such as director's duties or voidable transactions. Okay. And so in terms of just the differences there, it seems like that from the receivership, the company can come back again. But once it's in liquidation, it's a lot harder. That's kind of the end of the company, bar a couple of exceptions, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. The, the key emphasis on a receivership is the goal is to secure payment for the secured lender. That can be achieved and the company can, can continue. Whereas with liquidation, that is the end of that specific company. Right, okay. And... 
where there is a liquidator and a receiver are appointed, do you just want to like tell us briefly what kind of roles that they undertake if they're, if they're there at the same time and how that practically works? Despite a simple question, that's actually quite a complicated answer. Mm -hmm, I know. So in simple terms, if there's a first ranking general security agreement holder, the receiver will be dealing with the fixed assets of the company. So that's motor vehicles, plant and equipment, and all of that. Then we move on to the more complicated side of things, which is preferential creditors. So there are specific carves out for, for debtors and inventory notably, mm. where despite a general security agreement holder having a first ranking security interest, those have to go to the staff and inland revenue for unpaid GST and pay YE. So just wind back a little bit, so debtors and inventory, just want to just explain in layman's terms what that means because not everyone's kind of got the accounting accounting yep. house to unpack that. So. So, so debtors is just accounts receivable or people who owe the company money, whereas inventory is primarily stock and trade. So as an example, if we're dealing with, say, a factory, all the machinery, so manufacturing equipment, that will be considered fixed assets, whereas the finished product which is not subject to any form of retention of title or raw materials will be considered inventory. Right. So those, those two elements, they're carved out for the staff and IRD who are preferential. Mm -hmm. And so normally, who will deal with that in terms of if there is a liquidator and receiver, who normally handles the, the preferential assets? It's, it's up to the, the receiver and the liquidator to determine for the most part, but mm. generally speaking, it's who was there first. So if the receiver was there and they've got all the information and mm. so on, generally speaking, the receiver will deal with it. However, if the receivership was the cause because the event of default was liquidation and the liquidator has the information, then sometimes the liquidator will just deal with the preferential creditors. So there's, so no, there's no hard and fast rule around it. It's kind of more what's practical and who has the most information at the time. Set rule on that. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, I, th I think that's a really good overview for I in anyone that's not sure about the difference between a liquidator and receiver. Just to recap, a receiver, they're appointed by a secured party. That secured party will have a security over all of the assets of the company. They come in essentially like the director of the company. They can sell, um, sell the assets, sell the business. They can realize whatever is there, um, excluding the carve out for PREF if there's a liquidator. They are there, I think, principally for their client, which is the secured party, right? So the bank or the financier or whoever it is, they're there principally to get back money for that particular party. Mm -hmm. They have a general duty to other creditors that are unsecured, but their main goal is to get back as much as they can. And then a liquidator, their, their role is a bit broader. So they have a general duty or a main duty to all the creditors. So that's unsecured and secured. So they're there to really wind up the company and investigate other avenues that liquidators can. Um, so if you're either a secured lender and you are having problems with default or if you're a shareholder um, that is maybe having some difficulties right now post COVID, definitely reach out to us because we'd be more than happy to outline your options, what's involved and how you can move forward with um, with either of these insolvency options. So thanks for watching. Thank and you. Have a great day.